Okay, welcome back. Uh, Rhythm Desai is with us now. He's Managing Director and Chief Equity Strategist India. Morgan Stanley is joining us from the sidelines of the Morgan Stanley India Investment Forum. Rhythm, good morning. Good to have you with us here on CBC TV 18. Bright and early. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, Prashant Desai, you know, so as I was taking that commercial break, uh, I, was, uh, I, was, uh, I was saying I'm going to ask you when will foreigners return? We had the EPFR representative with us earlier. He was saying that dedicated India funds are still getting a lot of inflows, resilient. Is this the gem funds where there is reluctance? Uh, but what matters for us is at a net level, we get money in. When will that tight turn rhythm, according to you? Hey, Prashant, good to be back on, uh, on CNBC TV 18. Uh, so it's a little complicated, actually. Uh, there are multiple moving parts. So firstly, EM as an asset class, especially because of China, is on the back foot. So it's actually the least preferred equity market in our global pecking order. And I think that's also reflected in the flows. So if EM as a whole uh, is not receiving inflow, it is hard for India to receive inflow. So that's the first point. Now, having said that, uh, when we do the calculations, uh, we find out that uh, fund managers in, in, in with GEMS mandate, global emerging market mandates, are slightly underweight India. So ideally, they should have been overweight because India is a persistently a big outperformer in an EM context. But obviously, uh, you know, they have been worried about valuations and therefore they've been waiting for the market to correct. And the market is not obliging, so they remain underweight. India's weight in EM has gone up significantly in the last three years. So, you know, we were at around 8% pre-COVID. We're now 17%. And essentially, uh, fund managers have not been able to keep pace with the rise in India's weight in the index. In fact, uh, one of them asked me this question three days ago, that what would it take uh, in terms of money flow for, uh, for GEMS portfolios on average to be overweight India? The answer is a staggering 50 billion US dollars. Now, the largest inflow that uh, you know, FPIs have put into India in a 12-month rolling period is about 35. So this is a lot of money for them to put. The third is a, is, is a local reason. We have domestic inflows which just keep rising. Every morning, domestic mutual funds have to buy about $100, $150 million of stock. If they don't buy for five or six days, suddenly they have close to a billion dollars in cash and more work to do because the inflows don't stop. Now, in the market, there are only two cohorts. Uh, there are the domestic investors and then there are the foreign investors. You can't get a trade un until, uh, you, unless both, uh, you know, if both are buying. You only get a trade if one is selling and one is buying. So obviously foreigners end up selling. This changes in my view as we go into the second half of this year because the third cohort will get very active, which is the corporate issuer. So I expect a deluge of primary deals in the next uh, several months and that will then allow foreigners to start buying. So if I make a prediction here, it is that FPIs uh, will start buying India in the second half. And it's largely because uh, primary issuances will go up. So that creates the space for them to buy. Hi, Rhythm. Good morning and good to see you in. Nigel on this side. You know, hopefully they come back in the second half of the year, uh, as you told us, with good reason. But let's focus a little bit on the domestic money. That's been the savior, right? We're just scratching the surface in terms of the number of DMAT accounts as well. But what if there is some, you know, some kind of curve that's put on the retail participation in the FNO market? Do you think it'll SaaS sentiment or do you think the investor that's putting this SIP, the monthly numbers, is very different and it will not have much of an impact? So, Nigel, the SIP numbers have withstood a fair number of events over the last few years. Yes. And they only keep going up. See, the story started in 2015 when uh, the Prime Minister allowed 401k, sorry, <laughs> uh, provident funds to invest in Indian equities. This was very similar to what had happened in America in 1980, when 401k plans were allowed by President Reagan to allow, invest in equities. What you got then in the U.S. was a 20-year bull run, which ended with the Nasdaq bubble. Domestic households in America were buyers all along the way, even during the 87 crash when the Dow was down 22% in a single day. So they became very resilient. A similar thing is happening in India with two differences. One is the starting point of equity ownership on household balance sheet is very low. I estimate it's about 7-8%. It's gone up from, say, 5 
So it's still only, uh, you know, it's still single digits. In the U.S., by the way, that number even today is about 40 percent. And then the second thing is the demographics. When we entered the millennium, America had already started aging. Baby boomers started retiring and they started withdrawing their equity savings. In India, that doesn't happen for the next 20, 30 years. So we have a lot of legs to go on this. And I think that at some point in time, it's quite possible that the limit on provident funds and NPS, which is currently pegged at 15% of incremental flows into equities, that could be raised to 25. The last nine years have been very sweet for them. They've been able to deliver good returns to their uh, subscribers. Right. And it's largely because of the equity returns that they are getting. So I don't see the domestic bid going away uh, on a structural basis. Right. There could be cyclical ups and downs, but I think this structural bid is here to stay. All right, then, uh, Rhythm, let's talk investable ideas. Uh, you expect 15 to 16 percent sort of earnings uh, growth to continue for the index, uh, uh, for the index constituents, for the markets itself. You did say that a lot of the money is on the sidelines because of valuation. So where is it that you find pockets of value and where do you think things are overheated? Okay, so that number is actually 20 percent, not 15, 16. And there's a big okay. difference between 15 and 20. Uh, we are in a market where earnings are likely compounding at 20% for the next four or five years, and that makes the market cheap. 21 times headline multiple is masking uh, the attractiveness of the Indian markets because we are in an up cycle for growth. And I think we're just about halfway through this cycle, so there's a long way to go before uh, the earnings peak out. And, and what happens is that in a bull market, the earnings and the multiples both peak almost simultaneously. Uh, if you go to the previous bull market, the Nifty at the peak traded at 33 times earnings. And earnings as a percentage of GDP was at 7. This time, I think profits to GDP will go to 10. And uh, I, 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 I'm not going to predict where the P multiple goes, but you know, history suggests that there's more room for this P to go up. So in terms of returns, this bull market is a long way to go. Now, on the second part of your question on value, See, value is not about low P and low price to book. That's a very uh, lazy way of assessing value. Value is when you can buy future cash flows at a, at a rate which, is, uh, which you know, is better than your expected rate of return. So when you discount it by your expected rate of return, you get a number which is the share price, which is, below the, uh, which is above the current share price. So that's value. And I see a lot of value in the market. I see value in many places. Just to highlight a few, I see that in private banks. I think uh, we are in a very sweet cycle. Uh, margins have troughed. Growth at the, at the credit level remains quite robust. And the credit costs are not coming back in a hurry. And the stocks, I think, uh, uh, represent uh, very good value. I see value in consumer discretionary, like autos, auto parts, retail, uh, a slew of uh, uh, businesses that, uh, you know, benefit from discretionary spends by consumers. I see some value in industrials, not all across the board. Industrials, I think, is uh, probably the more tricky sector because the growth there, I think, will be stupendous. But some stocks uh, are trading at, uh, at uh, levels which may be discounting most of that growth. So we have to be careful about uh, making a ubiquitous call on industrials. I see value in IT services. I think the U.S. cycle is looking up, and IT services stocks look quite uh, attractive. So there's a lot of value everywhere. Where there is, uh, you know, there's limited value, I think, is in consumer staples. I don't think those stocks have the same earnings upside that uh, the rest of the consumption space has. So I would be a little cautious there. I think we have to be very selective in healthcare. Uh, value is not there across the board. And likewise, I think in global commodities, we have to be a bit more uh, cautious. Mm. Rhythm, uh, you know, <clears throat> so if, if the thesis is right, right, everything here, not everything, but over a, if you stretch the time horizons long enough, I mean, most things will do well, right? You got to, uh, of course, you got to be prudent and they'll do well in waves and uh, something will go up first and then something else. And so uh, my question uh, now is, of course, what, what's right ahead of us in that sense? And I think uh, government policy and where, where the government focus and thrust is likely to be, and I'm sure at the conference you will get a lot of questions uh, in that sense uh, from investors who are there, uh, wh where is the thrust likely to be? Some have suggested that there will be a, a sort of concerted push now to help consumer demand uh, pick up. 
you know, uh, th we reported yesterday on the on the housing bit. Uh, there is, uh, you know, this morning I was reading a report talking about a Somanathan uh, plan to kind of uh, to to increase more money in the hands of retired government servants. I mean, you know, maybe in a way go back to uh, some of what the old pension scheme gave. That perhaps uh, could be a way. And there is there is so much more which is being talked about. What is your sense, Rhythm? Uh, you know, important trust areas from a market-sensitive uh, point of view. So, Prashad, I don't think it's the instinct of this government to redistribute taxes in the form of cash in the hands of people. That's fueling inflation. And over the last 10 years, we've worked very hard to uh, uh, to earn macro stability. And that is the basis of this economic cycle. It's the basis of how India's external deficit has contracted. It's why inflation volatility is at all-time lows. So a lot of the gains that we have accrued is largely because of this government's incessant focus on macro stability. As I have repeatedly said, the prime minister is an inflation hawk, and it doesn't serve the purpose of controlling inflation and its volatility by distributing cash into the hands of people. So building social infrastructure, I think, is the way forward. So we've Rhythm, already heard possible, about housing, and I think is, is it possible to projects. redirect? Hey, so, apologies, but uh, since we're short on time, let me just interject. Is it possible to redirect some of this, uh, you know, within the confines of being fiscally prudent, uh, to to doing what I said, which is consume, uh, supporting, I mean, a consumption at the mass end. So, Prashant, you know, just to uh, shorten my answer to, uh, the best way to do it is to fuel an investment cycle. Investments get jobs back, jobs get cash flows back, cash flow gets consumption back. It's the right way to do it, and I think that's the way the government will do it. And what we will see in the budget is a reiteration of the transition from government spend to private sector spending. The government is going to take a step back. It did a lot of heavy lifting during COVID. I think we are, we are heading into a primary balance. We'll be the only country in the top 15 nations in the world with a primary balance, which is hyper bullish for stocks. So it's going to come via the investment cycle, and that's how you'll filter down into better consumption. I think we will see a big, uh, sort of big change in the July budget as compared to the interim budget, because some of what you said, which is the government holding back, we saw that, right? In terms of the spends allocated uh, in the BE numbers, the, uh, the estimates, I mean, on roads, we saw that on uh, so many other areas, defense and uh, you know, the percentage increase in FY25 BE was much smaller as compared to what we've seen over the last couple of years. Uh, and, and the argument back then was, of course, that the government can yeah, only so do so yeah. much. The private sector needs to step in. So will we see something very different in this uh, full budget? Yeah, the difference between February and July is that the government has an additional 50 basis points in its pocket. Because what was not in the interim budget was the 30 basis points of extra dividends that the RBI gave. And if you recall, the interim budget was on the basis that the fiscal deficit will be at 5.8% per F24. That's actually come in at 5.6 now. So 20 plus 30, that's an extra 50 basis points to play around with. I think the overall fiscal con uh, consolidation will be ballpark around the same number, which is around, say, 5. And then you have an extra 30, 40 basis points uh, to decide where to allocate. That's a lot of money, by the way. Uh, so the government does have some flexibility in the in the current fiscal year to spend a bit more than what was there in the interim. I think a lot of that spending will be targeted towards uh, investments. Uh, I would highlight railways uh, very especially. I think we wrote a very detailed report on this one month ago. I think that's going to occupy top attention of government spends. Uh, there could be, uh, as we uh, discussed, mass housing. And then uh, I think renewable energy. I think that's another area which will uh, attract a lot of attention. So maybe if I were to single out three sectors, these are the three sectors. Maybe there's a rejig on PLIs, so sectors such as defense, such as aerospace, food processing, lab group diamonds. You know, these may actually get revised uh, PLI plans. All right, Rhythm, final question before we let you go then. Uh, things are looking up for India. We're in a bit of a Goldilocks scenario, which is great news. What are the risks then? You know, crude has been fairly well behaved, which is good for us, irrespective of how other commodities have flared up. Uh, a couple of risks, risks that you'll be tracking and a quick comment on crude being well behaved. Yeah, so I think from a risk perspective, we have to be careful about global growth uh, because India is trying to increase its engagement with the rest of the world. 
So uh, if global growth doesn't fare well, it does put India back. I would worry about China's deflation uh, because China Chinese deflation creates greater competition from uh, for Indian companies trying to sell abroad, and that could be a very important threat. China's currency could be depreciating, which could make us less competitive versus China. I think we have to worry about the capacity constraints that we have. There's still a lot of supply side work that has to be done for us to sustain higher growth rates in the judiciary, in bureaucracy, in education, in skilling, uh, in health. Um, and on oil, actually, Nigel, the, the, the math has changed for India. See, the intensity of oil to GDP has halved in the last six, seven years. So we are less sensitive to oil. But if oil went up $30, $40 all of a sudden, then it would create near-term pain. But otherwise, I think uh, oil is a lesser concern for us than in the past. All right, uh, Rhythm, uh, wishing you a good conference ahead. Appreciate you joining in and uh, running us through your thoughts. We look forward to touching base with you in the time to come as well. All the best for the conference. Thank you. Thank you.